So what's up guys, welcome to DIY or Die. I'm here with Brendan from Flavora, and we're just gonna do a quick little interview, kind of just, I got him here, so I figured, ask him some questions about his company, about, you know, what he thinks about the future of vaping, what he thinks about UK vaping, and uh, really just kind of pick his brain for a little bit so you guys can get a better understanding of what it's like to be, you know, the owner of a flavoring company in an industry that's pretty crazy. Absolutely. So we're at Vape Jam UK. Um, we've been hitting a lot of show. This is our second show in the UK. We were at the uh, Birmingham show last summer, and so it's been it's been really good to get out of the U.S. to see some other it, to see and talk with other companies that are making juice again. So um, a lot of our customers in the last two years since deeming are companies that are making products for markets outside the U.S. and so. That means that we have to be in a place like this, where you got all the TPD EU companies that are coming here because they see the UK. The health, national health system is really positive towards vaping. Um, some people are going to Asia. There's a big show coming up in Stuttgart that we wish we'd like to be at. There's a lot of DIY there, mm -hmm. a lot of DIY in France. So, for a company like ours that is a vapor flavoring company. We've got to be. We've got to be in those places where people are doing R and D to release new commercial products, where mixers and and actually even brick and mortars are showing up to look at flavors as a possible item to put in their stores. Whereas you know in the United States since August eighth, if if you didn't have your your kind of your your flavors all pinned down at that point, then you'd stop doing R and D. So there was a, a huge you know flurry of activity that spring and summer. Yeah. Everyone getting everything that they could by August 8th, but after that, you know, it's like all quiet. Yeah. So we, we have the good fortune of, we meet up with a lot of current customers at this show. So we're outside of our own kind of home base, the United States, but we're meeting with some of our current customers that are both based here in Europe, or there's some of the American companies that we're working with that are marketing and, and launching new products in the TPD market. So because our flavors, uh, we've, you know, got our flavors through TPD with a lot of other brands, uh, we kind of have the experience we can direct people if they're making a new product, hey this is going to work in these countries and we can provide you all the information you need. So um, working with companies that want to get into this regulated market is something that, we're, that's why we're here. So whether they're like a you know UK mixer or if they're a Canadian guy that's been you know constantly making new lines up, uh, we meet with them here and, and talk with them about their needs in this market. Also seeing like um, short fills and keeping up on the, the innovative packaging requirements. That's another thing that they've had outside the United States is more of a, I mean the, the sizes have changed a lot. Last show we were at in Birmingham, everything was, was these three packs of 10 mil bottles and now you got the short fills with the Nick shot. So yeah, that was the big change. That was, I mean that was the biggest thing at the show. It seemed like companies wanted to show shops in the UK that hey yeah. we have short fills now buy our short fills, yeah. you know, and what was interesting was there was a lot of people in the UK saying, I don't even know how long these short fills are going to last, and, yeah. you know, these companies are switching all of their inventory for the UK to short fills, and then they're going to have to probably switch back to something else, um, but I wanted to ask you, um, how much of your company focuses on, if, if you can answer this, how much of your company uh, is commercial, and how much yeah. of it is, is DIY? It's, it's about 90% commercial. To be honest, like the the amount of juice that goes into commercial production, um, it it really is a different order of magnitude than DIY. Mm -hmm. But I would say that to that in that same sense, ninety percent of our R and D comes from DIY, though. Yeah. That is the test bed where uh, where we get the feedback and we look for what is it that people need, what are they mixing, and, and how how are these flavors being used the best and optimized? Who are the you know, most talented? people to work with and what do they want and that's where we come up with a new product then we've got to take that and, and we've got a you know competitive market where we're competing against these candy companies that uh, you know European flavor companies that make stuff for for uh, what, what bump, bump into someone today that works with Haribo making gummy bear but gummy bear flavors and uh, you know Just they, like decades of experience yeah you know you got decades of experience making a certain type of application so we're coming from it with a deeper, we hope to have a deeper knowledge of what are the needs of, of a flavor uh, for vaping and working with that mixer who's a, who's a real artist in the vape world and trying to meet his needs. So that comes from, that really does come out of the DIY experience. But 
as far as like as a flavoring company, it's really diff it would be very difficult to survive, if not impossible to survive 100% on the DIY market at this time. Yeah. I mean, in the future, I think a lot of things will move, the DIY market will grow, like two to three years, I really expect that to be a bigger, um, a bigger product, a bigger flow of flavoring to DIY, but at this point, I mean, you can send gowns and drums to commercial guys that sell millions of units a month. Mm -hmm. Another question I wanted to ask was, um, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier, that there was a little bit of a controversy with the flavoring company, and we were talking a little bit earlier about compliance and following FDA regulations, yeah. uh, whether they're TPD or FDA, and I just wanted you to kind of explain exactly how long you've been following protocol for, reg for regulations, specifically to the point where companies are seeking you out because all of your flavorings are compliant in both markets. Yeah, so that comes back to the kind of uh, business planning that I did. Before we launched Flavora, and before releasing our first 20 flavors, which was actually, I mean, is done with the Reddit community. Um, at the time, it was a very, you know, and still is a very vibrant community with lots of positive criticism to help, uh, help a company, a young company like ours, figure out what their product line should be. But before we even did that, we were working on the the fact that this this product is for vaping, a flavoring for vapor. So, looking at the elements of what presents as the best pro flavor profile in vapor, what are the compounds that we anticipate are possibly not going to be good on toxicology testing? Because at the time, uh, 2013, 2014, you knew that there was going to be some type of FDA action on. On uh, on the vapor vapor products, and uh, if that followed the same sort of structures that they used to tobacco products at the time, then you know you're going to have the, the the system of tobacco product master files. There's going to be the the uh, the har harmful compounds and things like that going to be looked at. And essentially, you're going to have to know exactly what's in the juice. You're going to have to either have already cleaned it or have a plan to clean it and make sure that those 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 ident those known toxic compounds are not in there. So. You know, if you're at the drawing board and you know those things, then you can create a full product line that meets those criteria. So that's what we did, and uh, we haven't had to release version twos of things because we started version one with the right compounds. And and I, and I think this conversation was spawned a little bit because there seems to be some sort of notion that only certain companies are following protocol, following these safety regulations, and it's just not true. That might, you know? I mean. There might be some, you know, random brand that uh, that's here and then gone, but to get to be able to work with, in our case, customers that make an order of magnitude more than we do in a month in many cases. And if they're if they're making a million units a month, that's a lot more than we do. So we have to be able to meet their needs and in a technical a technical way. And they need to know what's in their juice. They need to. It needs to be made in a in a regulated or controlled environment. So there's a lot of standards in the United States that um, that are being developed for vaping, but there already were those standards for food. So you got you got things like FEMA grass, and um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of GMP and uh, sta various various um, third party verification. Heck, just to get just to get uh, certified with kosher, you know, if you want to have a rabbi come in and, and give you a kosher stamp, you have to have done all kinds of important you know, food, food, uh, food grade stuff. It, it doesn't mean, you know, like puffing up your chest and saying, oh, my clean room's ISO 7, mine's ISO 6. It's like, there's actually, there already, there already are some standards that, uh, that it existed before been done. that. Yeah, that yeah. was already done. So I, I want to kind of switch the subject a little bit. Speaking on, um, in the UK, I remember seeing some type of criticism about your company in regards to getting flavors out to the UK and okay. pricing. And I'm not exactly sure what the situation was or, or what issue there was, yeah. but I just remember seeing there was a certain issue with pricing and, and getting people flavors in the UK because sometimes I'll release a flavor and someone in the UK is like, well, we can't get Flavora. Yeah. You know? So, so is there like some type of like, uh, is there a reason why or is some type of well, solution? Well, uh, the f there are a lot of hurdles to shipping flavors. Um, Most of your flavors are ethyl alcohol based. Many of them are, and if they are, they typically have a flashpoint that makes them a flammable product. So, mm -hmm. uh, when you're shipping to the UK, you're shipping by air. So then, it's a flammable product being shipped in a plane, has all kinds of restrictions. They treat it like it's gasoline, but it, it really is not. 
probably the box is more flammable than the flavoring, but it, it does make a lot of, it adds up a lot of fees and a lot of, uh, a lot of smaller customers cannot buy from us directly if we're going to follow the rules. And we, we follow the rules. That's, we have to follow the rules. That's just because we, we want to be a, a flavoring company that we want to stick around. If, uh, if we didn't follow the rules and one day something bad happens, we go out of business and that's not worth it. So, um, we've so had some flavoring companies ship alcohol flavorings um, all across, all across, and you're saying that they're not there's there's a certain type they're not following a certain rule. No, not necessarily. I have excuse me. I can't. I really can't speak about other flavoring companies. I just know about how ours works, and I, I'm. Is sure there like a price that you have to pay to ship yeah, extra? For it it, caught, it depends on what you carry. I think um, our fees can be about a hundred and. Hundred twenty-five dollars, seventy to hundred depends on DHL, UPS, whoever it is. Um, it's between seventy and one hundred fifty dollars, depends on the country, to ship just the fee on top of the already you know whatever the weight is, mm -hmm. just the fee for shipping dangerous goods. So if if you're if you're buying a two pound box of flavoring, and uh, maybe it's got you know eight ounces total of flavors. And that's costing you fifty dollars worth of flavora, something like that. Fifty, say seventy-five dollars of flavora. But now you have to pay one hundred and fifty dollars worth of dangerous goods shipping fees on top of that. You're paying twice as much for the shipping as you are for the flavor. So because of that, our strategy is to work with distributors or, or kind of sink, get a, get a source in each country or each region mm -hmm. that we can work with someone who will inventory our flavor and then ship from their own location. That makes it a lot easier, especially in the UK. Yeah, because it, the, it was a, a Chef's Flavors yeah. um, forum where I saw saw those criticisms because I was wondering, I was like, well, I wonder why yeah. they're having an issue getting Flavora there. So are you are you still trying to work with Chefs to get your stuff over there? Or we is it do. over there now? Yeah, we, we do have uh, a lot of flavors with Chefs, and uh, we like them. They're, they're one of the companies that you want to work with yeah. when you're in our place because they have a... Fo they have a they have a mindset that uh, that that's, that understands the full spectrum of vape scene. They, they've got their own chef's flavors, or chef's vapors. You know, they got their their e juice lines that they came out with initially, and I think we worked with them on some of those. But then they realized that DIY is going to continue to be a big thing, and so they focus a lot of resources on that. I mean, they do one shots. They're innovating. So being with them as they move through the market in their region is really important. Yeah. Um, and then. For us, needing to have partners like that in every region that know their market and that we can that we don't compete with, but we empower with our product. That's a, that's kind of the mindset we have. So, other regions that are hard for us to ship to, like Australia, South Africa, even you know Japan, countries where they have a lot of barriers to entry, whether it's the the dangerous goods that are flammable or it's like a, a protective market where they don't want outside food products, like a Brazil. Um, you have to adapt your product to whatever that market needs. I also wanted to kind of yeah. ask you, just so people understand, you also vape, right? Oh yeah. You're a vaper. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We, Some, uh, sometimes you, you know, these, you'll see, you know, flavoring companies or vaping companies and the guy doesn't vape and it kind of adds a different type of outlook I on the company. I would you know? say that 90% of the stuff that I vape is stuff that our own customers send to us. So, or, you know, come back from a show like this with a lot of samples too, mm -hmm. but uh, everyone, Everyone in our office vapes or mixes. I, I, that's something I haven't required people that work at Flavora to mix, but yeah. we have a mixing station. So we have like, we have a you know bunch of nail polish racks with all of our flavors too. Yeah. And um, you just like mess around. And yeah, we mess around. You gotta know. I mean, if you're gonna talk to someone about the flavors, you have to know how they work and yeah. how they perform in mixing. And so, being a mixer yourself is the only way to do that. Now, one question I want to ask you. I've asked you this before when we interviewed you a while back. Yeah, that was um, a, while ago, a couple of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was in Mexico at the time, too. I think I was phoning yeah, in from Mexico. Yeah, you were doing something. But I haven't, you haven't ever caught me in the United States. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. But uh, I, I, I do want to bring it up again, um, because it seems like Flavora kind of goes after flavor profiles that are a little bit more obscure yeah. than the just the regular kind of strawberry, banana. You know, you have some of those, but yeah. for the most part, especially more, more lately, you know, things like Isai tea, yeah. which I have no fucking clue what that is. Yeah, I can explain or, that or, one or too, like, the naming of that flavor. Yeah, or like, uh, you know, uh, what's another one that you, that you had that was like a... Well, the avocado. Avocado, or, sunflower, uh, I think yeah. was one of them. Oh, oh uh, explain, maybe sugar orchid. Sugar maybe. orchid, yeah. that, that's one. But explain some of the reasoning behind trying to go after more obscure, maybe harder to implement flavorings. So, 
I mean, if you just straight up wanted to move product, then you'd go and make the most buttery, creamy, um, meringue kind of bakery notes that everyone's going to use as a base. But then when I go to a show and I vape a hundred different flavors or, you know, yeah, dozens of lines in a day, everything starts to taste the same. Yeah. And when I go and meet with the mixers, they all want to be distinct. Everyone wants to have something that is new or that other people don't have. And that means we gotta, we, we get, you know, get to wander off into the woods and find new stuff. Everything that we, we produce though comes from some type of request. I, I mean, I didn't even, I'd never even heard or could ever even pronounce the name Guanabana yeah. until this mixer in Brazil was saying, you guys have got to make this flavor. It's so wonderful. I love it. And, uh, and so we start, we, we came out with Guanabana, Soursop, a uh, bunch of other tropical fruit flavors. Both are awesome. And, yeah, and I love them too. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't even recognize how important and how wonderful those flavors could be myself until we started working with the mixer to make them. Are but they the, like more expensive or more difficult to make? Not necessarily. It, um, it depends. Like, or is the process pretty much similar for all flavorings? It's it's the full spectrum. So in some cases, you know, you might have different levels of the same compounds making a whole family of fruits, and then you know you, you test the different flavors, and really you're just you're kind of on uh, you're you're actually dealing with similar things. That's where you can get a you know one flavor becomes a has a different note at a higher concentration level as it kind of morphs. But then you know you have a spectrum of artificial versus natural flavor, na natural extract. We've actually We've never made a big emphasis on that side of the of the uh, flavor market. As far as like uh, just advertising, how is the flavor made? It's it's kind of it's usually beyond the scope of what most people want to learn about. But, you know, DIY is different, so a lot of DIYers they do want to dig in deeper. Um, I I do like as you were talking about obscurity though, and whether a flavor needs to be obscure, and I, and my answer is to that is yes. I, if so you, you actively, you want to kind of push the boundaries a little absolutely. bit. Absolutely, because we see flavoring as a, as a empowering thing for an artist. It's like, it's like the color for painting or the notes for music. It's, it's the tools, the base, it's the rudimentary tools that you need to be creative with. Uh, we would always rather, in the case, I always use the, the example of, of a blueberry muffin. We would rather release a muffin and a blueberry or in our case, like you know, graham cracker and a blueberry, and you can make it into a blueberry muffin, versus composing something that's a standalone. So, whenever it comes down to like, okay, how do we want to make this new batch of flavors? We always try to go down to the rudimentary notes and make something that's interoperable, but puts the creative control with the mixer. So we we stay away from stuff that's going to be a standalone flavor, and we try to we try to make something that's instead empowering for someone to mix with. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of our driving philosophy. Uh, we we do have this notion at Flavora of not wanting to compete with our customers. So whether it's you know like people ask us, do you want a co-pack or do you want to make a one shot? You say compete, yeah. Like we just say no. Make a one shot or an e-liquid line. And, yeah, you know. we don't we don't have an e-liquid line. We don't have a vape shop. We don't have uh, we don't pack anyone else's product. We just focus. We always try to narrow our focus onto a couple of things consistent with our mission which is to make tobacco obsolete. The way that we do that is by making flavors that are so good that the vapor never needs to strike a match again. That's right right on our About Us page. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to have a mullet? So, uh, one of the guys, <laughs> one of the guys uh, at Flavor, his, his wife, his, Bryson's wife, is a shout hairstylist. Shout out Bryson. Yeah, shout out to Bryson's <laughs> wife, Andrea. Um, Andrea gave me this haircut on Thursday. Uh, she touched it up a little bit. I, well, I had English style mullet, I guess. It's a moulet in that case, yeah. Uh. <laughs> it's in my mind. It's like the, the the Toyota Camry of mullets. If I was ten years younger, I would have wanted the Camaro mullet, where it's like full on. Yeah, party like, in the front. Yeah, big time party in the front and back. Like, but I had to keep the same ratios, you know. Yeah. But I just can't grow hair like I used to, so <laughs> it is what it is. But it's like the Toyota Camry mullet. No, and, uh, I dig it. Yeah, it thanks. Character, gets yeah. character. I, I wanted to be the only guy with the mullet. I think I am right now. Well, at definitely at the show. I didn't yeah. see any mullets at the show. Yeah, a lot of flat brimmed hats. A lot of these hats, yeah. So I put this hat on, and you can't can't really tell. No, it kind of looks like you you pushed it back. It's a got little a little bit of flow in the back, yeah. but then pop it off. <laughs> it's a little it's surprise. Down to business. <laughs> yeah. I also want to ask, um, when you started Flavora, 
how did you how did you get the money? Were you funded? Was there investors, or did you? It was just all out of pocket. It's a lot like of, a super expensive endeavor. It is a lot of leverage, um, a lot of time, a lot of good timing, and uh, leveraging that timing and opportunity. So, at the time that I started, I started planning for Flavora. I was still in the Marine Corps, passing out e-cigarettes to guys in my platoon. That was that was that was where I became a believer in vaping. Mm-hmm. So. I was in the Marine Corps 2012, and I was passing out cigalikes to guys that smoke. Because in the military, there's a lot of people that smoke or chew in order to stay awake or just, you know, yeah. to you know, actually banned cut the vaping, stress. right? In the Navy. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I've been out for a while now, but there... Maybe did. You could... At least on the ship. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. They um, they could do that for sure, especially, you know, maybe they made the argument, hey, it's, it's hazing up the, the deck here or something. I think it was just, like... Battery concerns. Oh, battery. Yeah, that, that makes sense stuff. too. Yeah, the, the concern about lithium batteries now is everywhere. Yeah, everywhere, especially the FAA. But anyways, so I was I was in the Marine Corps and I and I was captivated by e-cigarettes, and I had the opportunity to start working with a friend in the flavor industry at that time, and he was working in the e-cigarette space too as a flavorist. So I mean, on a you know massive scale, flavoring some of the at the time the biggest the biggest e-cig brands. And so we started working together to create a DIY line that would be all made for vapor and that would be available to people online. So um, using the internet as a way to sell stuff and uh, leveraging some of my past my experience before the, the, uh, the Marine Corps, which was with online sales and marketing, to bring that new product line to market. So we went to, the first stop was the, the Tobacco Plus show, show in Las Vegas. Which was half tobacco and and uh, and cigars and uh, and like shisha type hookah things, and then uh, then a little bit of of uh, e liquid. But it was very early, er, like different e liquids. You know, everything was 1.5 ohm, and and there was no, there was no such thing as dripping and and uh, e cigs were still a little bit different. Yeah. But there was not a a flavor made for vaping at that time. Yeah. So that was what I started. I went to to about a hundred vape shops in 22 states. I literally drove home from Virginia where I left the Marine Corps and I drove all through the south and stopped at every vape shop that I could. Um, I, I, I went to Camp Pendleton a lot. I'd go to all the vape shops around there and, and just talk with mixers and figure out what their needs were. And then we launched to DIY first on Reddit and then uh, followed that up with launching to commercial customers as well. And so then the, the synergy between the two uh, is what really really worked for us. So, when the U.S. market was still developing new stuff, and we had the feedback and the requests from DIY playing into the the actual commercial needs, that's what really helped us grow beyond 20 flavors to now 185. So, ba- building on that foundation is what we did. But yeah, I I, I more or less spent every penny that I had. It was a big risk. Yeah, it was a big risk. I I, I think buying our machine, our packing machine, was the first big expenditure that I made mm. and at that point you know it better work out and and hope and you know hopefully it does and it and it did because of the community like at the time it was a, we were not the only people taking a big risk on vaping a lot of other guys were yeah. buying machines filling out clean rooms and and doing whatever they could to to create new product so yeah it was it was a pretty cool time I would add back to your question though Wayne fill it out a little more to uh, explain how Flavor started and the leverage that we were able to create is that I was able to work with flavor chemists because I am not one personally and I don't have the the experience to be one it, it's something that takes decades of experience but I was able to work with with flavor a team of flavor chemists whose experience making flavor profiles for the tobacco industry as well as many other industries that you flavors you profiles you'd be familiar with from from uh, candy baking you know beverage but to work with that level of talent and leverage that to make from the ground up a line of flavorings for vapor, that's how we were able to start from day one with a product line that could pass and, and be, um, be acceptable in the future that we anticipated. Yeah. So that's, how, that's how we end up where we are now, where we can work with, with customers that, are very, that have grown a lot and that are very large and that are continuing to push out into new markets. I don't know, to, to kind of finish it up, where do you see Flavora, you know, in about 10 years? Where do you see vaping? Where do you see 
do, do you do you plan on branching out into other industries? So, the one one that there's some of uh, some of my thinking is already being stitched into our product line right now. For instance, our new glass bottle. Um, one of the the most frequent criticisms we've had, rightly so, from the very beginning, is the is the caps and the leaks, and it happens with a concentrated flavoring in a small plastic bottle. So we've been trying to, for over, uh, actually at this point about eight months, have a better product and better packaging. Because in the future, in the next three to five years, I see DIY type flavorings for vapor being a product in brick and mortar stores. And I want to have a product that can be presented at a brick and mortar store as part of a, either a kit or an assortment where someone that has you know, kind of run out of options and the commercial juice can make their own and mm -hmm. learn about it at a shop. So I think a lot of vape shops are going to, they're going to add the knowledge and the product lines for people that do DIY. It's not going to just be online forums. It's going to be actually physical in place. And that is what's happening in other markets. Like in you know, the German market, we're really excited about breaking in there with the DIY brick and mortar market. We're trying to find a good partner in Canada to do that with as well. Uh, Japan, there's a lot of places where DIY is a necessity. So, um, in you said uh, up to 10 years, I, I, I would hope that in 10 years we have Flavora available in, in 100 plus countries at, at, at thousands of stores, st thousands of specialty shops that sell DIY vaping supplies. I really believe that that's going to be the reality in, in, those, in, in that time. Yeah, that was the goal too with with DIY eyes to try to just keep growing DIY. Yeah. And just you know, just follow it wherever it goes. If it grows into shops, if it grows into you know this 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 big industry, or for it's like a super small niche, like we were talking like knife making or something. Yeah. Like that, then just kind of just just taking it along for the ride and and hopefully just getting it out to as many people as possible and letting them decide if they want to do that. Yeah. And so far, it seems like people enjoy it and. It is empowering and it's fun. It's creative and it gets you off of like a, a pretty serious, uh, deadly addiction. Yeah. You know, like once you start mixing, it just becomes so, it becomes so ingrained in you. you I, know? It's I part of routine. I totally agree. It the it's the most empowering thing about vaping is that you have, you have this device, but you can you can make it fit your needs. Whether it's the coil, the cotton, the flavor profile in your juice, it's it's all it's all adaptable to your needs, so it's always empowering. And I think DIY e-juice is the kind of heart and soul of, of vaping in that way. Yeah. And so, I mean, you get your slings and arrows. There's, there's lots of competition. There's lots of people either creating drama or trying to start it. There's lots of people trying to regulate it and fight over the money. But at the end of the day, it's about the people that need the product. And, I mean... It's we I it's the it's the favorite it's our favorite thing is to get feedback from customers that say, because of your flavors I've been able to quit smoking, and because of your flavors I now I'm mixing for my mom and she's been smoking for forty years and she quit too, so we get that kind of stuff all the time. It's one of my favorite things to have the you know comment section where someone is about to push place the order, push the button and they leave a little note and we get those every day and it's awesome. Yeah. So that's one of the best things. Right on, man. I yeah. appreciate you sitting with me. Thanks and, for coming to the show, too. Yeah, I appreciate you guys taking me out here, dude. Yeah. It, was, it was awesome. And, and just being able to kind of hang out with you guys, meet with you guys, because we've been in contact for years. And yeah. like you said, never in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> but it, was it, was, it was cool finally getting to meet you and, and the guy behind the, the camera, Aaron, over there. Yep. It was cool hanging out with him. And, dude, I wish you guys the best of luck. And, you know, hopefully we get more and more projects together in the future and yeah we uh, love it when you mix with our flavors so i love your flavors cool so thank just you keep making good flavors and i'll keep making good recipes and right on. all will be well <laughs> anything you need let us know all right man all right cool thanks man <laughs>